go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Niels Bunger. I'm a partner here at Pair. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming today and being part of our speaker series today. So just very briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our fund for about two minutes, and then I'll introduce um, the star for today, Mike Gaffrey. So our fund, Pair, we've been going for six years now. We're on our third fund. We have $300 million under management. We're a pre-seed and seed investor, and we've been involved from the early days from some really great companies like Branch Metrics, Garden Health, Gusto, DoorDash, and many more. Um, we have grown over the years. We're now five full-time investment partners, uh, plus a whole staff so that we can provide uh, excellence across engineering, recruiting, analysis, and other functions. Um, you know, what distinguishes us is uh, among the five investment partners, we've started eight companies. And so we really come at it from like being founders with a checkbook more than a traditional venture fund. And what we seek to do is help great founders lay the foundations of their category defining companies. So we're often the first money into a company. We invest at pre-seed and seed primarily um, as first investments with check sizes of 250K up to about $3 million. And then we'll follow on. So um, that's enough about Pair for today. Really today is about um, a wonderful individual, Mike Gaffrey. Um, Mike Gaffrey is a general partner at Canvas Ventures. Uh, they invest in series A and B primarily. Um, he's invested in a number of amazing companies, uh, including Superhuman, Strava, Fly Homes, Cloud Kitchens, Optimizely, Metro Mile, Phil's Coffee, Fair and Padlet. Uh, he was also a founder and company builder previously, a Yelp executive for seven years, and then uh, was BD and Corp Dev as well as CEO of Eat24, a co-founder of Stitcher, and previously investor at Social Capital and Summit Partners. Okay, um, Mike, hey, thanks so much for, for joining today. That's, that's quite the bio. I don't know how you picked all those amazing companies to invest in too. <laughs> Uh, knock on wood, I just got really lucky. Right place at the right time. Uh, a little bit of hard work sprinkled with a lot of luck. Well, okay. Well, uh, definitely you'll have to tell us how, how you get all that great luck plus uh, the hard work. But We could do that after in the Q&A. It's, it's open season. We can have Q&A, not just about the talk. Yeah, great. Well, I'm really excited for to do the strategic defensibility, to have you do the strategic defensibility talk. I think we actually talked about this a long time ago and then COVID happened, right? So yeah. I'm excited we're finally doing it. I, I feel like it's such an important topic and, you know, um, a lot of times founders don't know how to think about it. So I'm going to hand it off to you yeah. and, and let you talk. And then I think we're going to do Q&A at the end. So you can put a Q questions in the Q&A box for attendees. Um, and uh, you can also raise your hand, but we'll probably primarily take questions at the end. Yeah, load up the questions in the Q&A. You can build them all up there. And, and you prefer the Q&A to the chat, Niels? I mean, I think you can also use chat if yeah. you like, but what's cool um, for the attendees, if you do it via the Q&A, um, you can vote. People can vote on the oh, question. Smart. And that way, you know, like if a number of people have a similar question, we, we know to prioritize it more. So I recommend using the Q&A thing. And even if you're not asking a question, look at the Q&A and vote on questions that you think would be good to answer. Sounds like Q&A is the way to go. Sounds good. Well, welcome okay. everybody. Thank you for the great introduction. I'm a big fan of Pair Ventures. Uh, I've been friends with Pejman, I think for 15 years now. Um, gotten to know him early, so that's great. Uh, and excited to be here today. Uh, speaking with everybody uh, and surprised at the big turnout on a holiday week. I was wondering. So I guess people don't have uh, too many travel plans just yet. Uh, uh, still kind of holding back. So um, I'm Mike Bafari here to talk to you about uh, your strategic advantage and defensibility for your startups. Uh, whether you're a, a founder of a startup, you work at one, you're at a, a growing or scaled company that still applies, or you're an investor, anywhere in the ecosystem, I think there's some lessons in here that could be pretty interesting. Um, so let's get started. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I think the, my first point here is that every startup needs a strategic advantage. Uh, without one, investors will be pretty skeptical about um, your company uh, and, uh, and what's going on. You know, sometimes we use the analogy of a moat. Uh, so you see here, you've got this kind of water around in this image. And so, uh, if an investor asks you, you know, what's your moat, uh, that's what they're asking about. And, um, and, and the reason they want to understand this is, you know, if you have a great idea, you build something, uh, you get to scale, just because you're the first mover, that actually doesn't confer as much of an advantage as many founders think it is. Uh, the first mover advantage 
is helpful and we can talk about that, but it really only helps uh, if you're a first mover or oftentimes a fast follower who then has some kind of a, you know, some defensibility they can put around the business. Um, and the challenge is uh, I, as an investor, frequently see PowerPoint decks from, uh, from founders and they'll have, you know, the standard boxes everyone wants to check product, team, market, you know, they'll walk us through that really well. They'll even talk about traction and sources of funding. Those are like the top five basic things you'll always see. But what sometimes, and you know, and you'll get a user acquisition, LTV and TAC, uh, why now, why this idea, all this great stuff, very standard and kind of pitch deck 101. But what frequently surprises me is um, this idea of what's your defensibility? What's your strategic advantage? What's different? Uh, what will uh, another investor I just spoke to called it your durable advantage in the long run? Uh, that slide is often missing in a lot of decks. I, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say maybe half the time it's missing or it's not fully answered. It's not really dead on or the answer is kind of hand wavy. And you got to understand, um, at least from an investor perspective, and by the way, you're not building your company just to please investors. That's just one lens. But even for your own purposes, there's a, there's a reason investors are curious about this. Um, a lot of companies, you know, they don't have a full answer and the investors are focused on that as one of the number one things we're discussing. So it's worth figuring out, hey, what's my answer to that question? Do I really believe it? And why is everyone so fixated on this? So let's see, you know, what am I even talking about here? Let's, let's look at some examples. Um, you know, the, the one that's near and dear to my heart, uh, because I invest, as, you know, in the, the list Niels gave earlier, uh, as you could hear in a lot of marketplaces, um, I also invest outside of these marketplace business models, which we'll talk about a bit, in other consumer apps and SaaS businesses and, and software companies. Um, but with marketplaces, uh, when they have network effects, that's a real clear defensibility advantage. For example, with Airbnb, Uber, Grubhub, these are all marketplaces with network effects. We'll talk about those. Uh, and that's an easy one for us to dive into. Uh, but there's also just same side network effects. You don't need to be a marketplace to have network effects. Marketplaces have two-sided network effects. Um, which you can read more about, and I'll talk about some of the academic work behind that. Uh, uh, there's a professor, Tom Eisenman, out of Harvard Business School, if you want to kind of read up on it, who first exposed me to the idea um, many years ago, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but there's same side network effects as well, and those are very powerful and have been for Facebook, LinkedIn, and others. You know, you might also have a data moat. You might have the first mover advantage we, we spoke about. Uh, but what's interesting is if you look at these first mover companies, Casper, him, some of these others, it's tough. There's a question. It's how's Casper doing right now? And there's a reason why people ask that this defensibility question. First mover is often a weaker um, source of, of defensibility or durable advantage. Um, and then high switching costs, which are another area of a strategic advantage where um, when you have a network effect, you have switching costs sometimes. Uh, but you might also have it outside of a network effects business like Oracle or Salesforce, where you have a deep installation that's really embedded into workflows. It's very hard to switch over. And MuleSoft, uh, which my partner Gary Little uh, invested and sat on the board uh, before they were acquired by Salesforce, uh, you know that that can also be a, a powerful uh, strategic advantage. So let's zoom in here. And sorry, uh, there we go. Zoom keeps slip, skipping two slides at a time. Uh, let's talk about these network effects a little bit more. Um, a network effect is when a product or service becomes more valuable as more users use it. Uh, the famous example of this uh, in academic work is the fax machine. At the first when the fax machine came out, if only uh, two people had it, it wasn't very valuable. It only had one connection. But once you had four users, there were six connections. And once you had eight users, there were 28 connections. So as you can see, this is kind of an exponential curve. Um, as you're adding users linearly, you're actually getting exponential uh, growth in the value to those users, the number of connections they have. And that's a network effect. If you then want to switch to a different standard outside of fax, um, that's going to be tough. Um, and so we see that uh, in a lot of different areas. You know, we see that on one-sided networks, but then you also on a marketplace can see that with uh, two-sided networks. So uh, let's take Uber, for example, uh, which I mentioned earlier. You've got, um, you know, drivers uh, and riders, right? And so it's not that the drivers necessarily want more of that same side of the network. Drivers, the riders want more riders, but the drivers want to be in the place where all the riders are and the riders want to be in the place where all the drivers are. And this might all sound obvious to you, um, but it's surprising how often a, um, an analysis of this is missing from, from a pitch from startups or just in their own thinking. You know, forget about what the investors think, just for your own purposes as you think about, is my company gonna go the distance or is there something I can iterate? Um, 
So for example, uh, uh, so how do you evaluate your strategic advantage? Uh, I, you know, specifically with this marketplace example and two-sided network effects, to, to dive into it, I created a blog post with 15 questions. It's called the marketplace checklist. So you can Google this, you can follow me on Twitter. I'll put it on the, on the screen later. I'm just at new Mike and you can read this blog post uh, and other stuff I'm writing. But these are some of the questions I asked, like which side of the network values the other side more, right? So like in the Uber example, do the drivers value uh, uh, the riders more or do the riders value the drivers more, the supply or the demand? Who values, who values the other side more? We'll, we'll get back to the Uber example in a, in a minute. Um, is there an effective and proprietary method of distribution for each side of the marketplace? Um, like, do you have a, a special hack to get to those drivers or riders? Uh, how strong are the cross-side network effects? Um, and is there a metric that measures that, like a liquidity metric um, to see are transactions happening? Um, what are switching costs? How hard is it to go switch to a competitor? Like for Uber, how hard is it to switch to Lyft if you're a driver or a rider? Uh, what are LTV and CAC on the demand and supply side? So all of these are all kind of interesting questions and we can dive into these. And the point here is that your investor, for whatever your strategic advantage is, they're probably asking this next level of depth, you know, 10, 15, 20 more questions. They're trying to analyze this. Uh, and, and you want to have great answers to this too. You don't want to be just flying blind in this area. Oh, keeps going too. So um, the, that first question, which side of the network values the other more? Um, so, so in this Uber example, um, I, I'm curious what people think. Let's see if there's any, uh, well, I guess, yeah, I shouldn't. Uh, I shouldn't go off presentation mode, otherwise I can't see. But let's see if anybody in, um, in the chat here has made a comment or in Q&A on whether they think uh, it's riders or drivers. But I'll tell you the answer is, um, I think it's the, the, the riders that value the drivers more. The more valuable supply side of the Uber two-sided marketplace is the supply side in this case, uh, the drivers. Now, how can you tell that's the more valuable side? Well, it's the side that's being subsidized. Uber is smart, uh, they're no dummies. And they started, and by the way, they might not have realized this fully at the beginning because they weren't subsidizing drivers as much at the beginning. But as time passed uh, in their growth story, they quickly started paying up to $1,000 to get a new driver on the platform. Now you never got as a user a $1,000 coupon to be a rider. Why is that? You were less highly valued. It was important to have riders on the platform, but they only need to give you a $20, $30 coupon at most. I, you'd be hard pressed, I think, even to find that right now for Uber um, starting out. And so the point is, if you get a lot of liquidity of drivers, then riders are going to come and you have to have liquidity in every single neighborhood and every place these riders want to be. Uh, the value proposition is so compelling to riders, they will follow as long as the drivers are there. Um, all right. Now, how strong are these cross-side network effects? So, so maybe it is valuable um, to get more drivers, but how powerful it is, uh, is it? So let's take a look with Uber. Uh, Uber, you know, and number one here adds driver supply. Number two, that leads to lower wait time and fares. Number three, they get more riders. Number four, more riders per hour and higher earnings potential for drivers is really compelling to those drivers. Um, so now more drivers start coming on. And then there's more driver supply and this wheel keeps on spinning. This is actually a very, very powerful network effect. Um, and that's why Uber was, was able to do so well. And before we move on, um, it, it's worth noting switching costs, you know, for, for Lyft uh, and Uber, switching costs actually weren't that high on the rider side. It's pretty easy to download another app, put in your credit card really quick and just, you know, check that also. Um, so seemingly switching costs were low, but the network effect was so powerful. Um, just getting all those drivers signed up on the platform was so powerful because it's not as easy to onboard drivers for a different platform. You need to screen them. You need to make sure they're safe. Are they okay to drive? Is there anything wrong with their record? You know, how do you need a rating system that needs time to build up? Uber and Lyft won't let you steal their ratings of their drivers. So, uh, and by the way, it's hard for those drivers to manage like multiple apps and switch back and forth. They'll play those games with Uber and Lyft, but they weren't going to do like 10 apps. So a duopoly was able to be developed um, just because, you know, Lyft was able to get in there fast and effectively enough. Um, and for the drivers, trying to was okay and riders are willing to try to. But what we notice is three to five apps, that never really happened. So these cross-site network effects are really powerful, even in this case where duopoly developed. And actually, this is why Uber moved so aggressively early on, because they knew how powerful these network effects were. If they had been able to push a little harder, if they hadn't been slowed down in a couple places, there was a chance that Uber actually could have been ahead of Lyft 
or if Lyft had aggressively grown faster enough, they actually pioneered the, you know, what later ended up being the UberX model. They could have been first, uh, but since they were both neck and neck for a lot of it and Lyft was smaller, but close enough, they were able to, to retain this duopoly. Uh, so the next question I had on that list, I'm just zooming in again to, to one area of strategic advantage within marketplaces, just to give you context of even if your strategic advantage is different, how do you zoom into yours and, and, and use an analogy to the strategic advantage you think you've got? Um, so this next question is, is there an effective and proprietary method for distribution to each side of the market? Um, so, you know, Airbnb uh, had a, a very uh, effective method uh, to get out there and distribute. They would go out and onboard new users with their brand. Um, they were, you know, early on, uh, they were handing out famously uh, Obama O's uh, and, you know, and the McCain, the Captain Crunch, something like that, cereal boxes, anything they could do to, to onboard users. Um, but the interesting thing is those were the people staying there. They also were able to get um, a lot of people on the, um, the, the host side by, uh, by being a unique new source of revenue for a lot of people who couldn't put their inventory on VRBO. So previously, like if you had a couch that somebody could stay on um, and you had an extra room or an extra bedroom, that wouldn't really go on VRBO. VRBO would be like a full house, one week rental. Airbnb bootstrapped a lot of extra inventory that way. A lot of guests said, hey, here's a new source that's like cheaper than a hotel, it's different. It could appeal to me, it appealed to a younger demographic. That in turn led to more hosts coming on. They said, hey, there's a bunch of these new users, we can kind of monetize. And again, it, you know, that kind of bounced back and forth. They also uh, got early through a BD partnership with this company, Hipmunk, um, that, that had a lot of excitement around it early on. Hipmunk was listing Airbnb inventory, you know, that helped get a traffic boost. Any distribution advantage you can, you can get in there really kind of helps. Um, what are the switching costs? You know, we talked about this, uh, and here's a screenshot on, on Amazon, for example, because Amazon's marketplace actually has become the majority of their business. A lot of people think of Amazon as not a marketplace. eBay was a marketplace, and Amazon came on as the non-marketplace e-commerce competitor. But since these marketplaces are so valuable, since uh, they provide such a durable advantage, uh, Amazon actually started moving into marketplace, and now uh, over half their business is, is the marketplace model. And these reviews are very powerful, right? If you've got 30,000 customer reviews as a seller, is it easy for you to start over on a new platform? Probably not. Those are very high switching costs. And while users might not have as high of a switching cost, the supply side here does, and that's very sticky on the supply. They might try other platforms, but all the users are already there and their reputation's there, so they do less volume there. Um, you know, another question I asked is, what does liquidity look, look like? And famously for Uber, it looks like, uh, what are the number of minutes until you can get a ride on average in a market, right? So Uber found that every minute they can shave off that time was worth millions and millions of dollars. They had an entire team, actually, of, of brilliant people um, who I knew uh, who are off doing another startup now, just trying to figure out how they can shave like a couple minutes off that time accurately. Because if Uber overestimated that time inaccurately, they would lose, you know, uh, uh, millions of dollars, like I said. Um, at the same time, if they underestimated that time inaccurately, they'd get a low NPS, people would be upset and think they couldn't trust the estimation. But the, you know, the, the ultimate uh, you know, answer was having more drivers on the platform and more liquidity and more transactions would occur. They actually saw non-linear benefits um, as they got under 10 minute wait times, they would get exponential kind of increase in transactions happening. So you know, for StubHub or Craigslist or Amazon, it might be like time to transact, how quickly someone's able to come on and then transact with the platform. So every different uh, marketplace might have a different liquidity metric. But my main question to you is, you know, what is your liquidity metric? Uh, if you do have a marketplace, that's really important to understand and track. Um, what's the frequency of use? Uh, you know, so how frequently people are using your products? You know, this, and even outside of marketplaces, whatever your advantage is, that's pretty important. You kind of need to have um, either high frequency or a high transaction size, right? So Airbnb doesn't really, have the frequency that Uber has, but the transaction side more than makes up for it. Um, so you need one or the other or both. Uh, but you will, you will see some businesses with low frequency, low transaction size. Well, that's fundamentally not that interesting and not that much of an advantage. You know, an interesting intellectual question is, would you rather have high frequency or high transaction size if you can't have both? And I kind of think I'd rather, rather have high frequency because then you're getting a touch point and a branding opportunity, you know, like Uber every day with your users versus being an occasional use case. I think it's, it's a little more sticky to have that frequency if you can. Um, another you know, good sign that, you, that your strategic advantage is working 
is, does it become easier to acquire incremental supply and demand as your business grows, right? Um, and, and that actually was the case uh, for Airbnb. Um, you know, they found that it got cheaper and cheaper to add supply and demand um, in a market as their marketplace grew. And so that's a sign that uh, things are, are really working for them. Um, you know, another question I like to ask is, what's your take rate or monetization model? So if you really do have a, a powerful business model uh, and you, you, you do have something defensible, you should be able to capture a rent or a tax out of that. I see a lot of early stage startups that say, hey, look at all these transactions flowing through our platform, whether they're you know, a SaaS business or a marketplace or whatever, you know, a SaaS company might say, hey, we're helping people track this huge, you know, multi-millions of dollars of transactions. And then the next question is, okay, how much are you capturing? Well, we've got a $5,000 annual you know, average contract value on those. Uh, well, what that tells me is you're not actually capturing so much of the value you're creating maybe you're not creating that much value. That's the question. How defensible is what you're doing? And um, you've got to take a hard look in the mirror and say, if I'm doing something really defensible and strategic, people should be you know, jumping out of their seat to pay me. It should be obvious for them to pay me. If I'm afraid to charge them, why is that? Is there an inherent flaw in my model? And am I just kind of fooling myself with the vanity metric of top line growth um, that's not turning into net revenue for my, my company? Uh, and that's something important to think about. Um, you know, for a marketplace, another question is, uh, does it own the payment flow? So by owning the payment flow and actually capturing the way Uber, Airbnb, and other does the, you know, the credit card and having the payment all happen there um, versus Craigslist, for example, that doesn't, um, you know, it gets a lot more sticky that way. So there's, a, you know, people don't really use the Craigslist app on a daily basis quite as much. It's a great top of the funnel area, but it doesn't really help um, on the conversion as much. That's why when I was at Yelp, we launched a transaction platform because like Craigslist, we had the top of the funnel, but we wanted to own some of that transaction as well. That helped um, with our defensibility. That's actually why we acquired E24 and put food deliveries in the app. You know, we then sold the company to Grubhub, but created a strategic partnership where you can actually just order Grubhub orders, which is now, you know, merge with Just Eat um, right there inside the Yelp app and, and a dozen other, you know, integrations. So the payment flow can be very important as well. Um, and then another question, is there a risk of disintermediation? Um, so if you're in between supply and demand, for example, could somebody else insert themselves um, or, you know, more importantly, could supply and demand just speak directly um, or, or do they need you and why do they need you? Um, that's another question. Um, another question I like to ask is how fragmented is the supply side? Um, so, uh, you know, if, if all else is equal, do you want a more fragmented supply side or a less fragmented supply side? you want a more fragmented supply side. If you've only got a handful of people on your supply side that you're counting on um, in this marketplace model, then uh, you know, you're beholden to just a few, it's kind of like customer concentration risk um, from uh, Michael Porter and Porter's Five Forces. Uh, you know, that's again, to your strategic disadvantage, right? So, but by having a, a very broad base with maybe some larger suppliers, but plenty of, uh, of people on, on both the supply and demand side, you're a more active marketplace and that's more valuable. Um, so, you know, this is speaking of Porter's Five Forces, um, you know, I, I think this is what I would close on. Let me just double check if this is the last slide it is. You know, what's your strategic advantage? Um, you know, and, and, and so Michael Porter, if you haven't read his work already, definitely worth looking at this image and understanding, you know, he had the, uh, these five forces and, uh, you know, threat of new entry, threat of substitution, supplier power, buyer power, competitive rivalry, and this goes beyond marketplaces. Um, you know, the professor who's focused on marketplaces in general, like I said, is uh, Tom Eisenman, who looked at network effects. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to take his class in business school and open my eyes, um, you know, to, to the power of this stuff. And, and so, you know, some of this might come off as obvious on the one hand um, and, and kind of um, uh, pedestrian. And then some of this might come off as uh, kind of academic or ivory tower, but like, how does this apply to your business? Uh, but I'd say either way, uh, it's worth just having that next level of depth um, on it and not write it off as too obvious or too academic, um, but instead have a lot of good answers uh, to, to the strategic advantage for your, for your company and your business, whether it's a marketplace business model or not. So with that, um, I will, uh, I think, stop uh, sharing the full screen so I can see uh, the Q&A and some of this other stuff a little bit better. Um, yeah, Mike, thank you. This was, this was great so far. And yes. uh, it's like we have a bunch of questions. So, um, so I'm going to let Niels take the lead on just knowing, you know, um, which questions were upvoted and, um, 
sure i can i can uh, ask questions on on our uh, attendees behalf so one of the yeah. first i can read them if you do should we do brenda jen you just tell no, me who to brenda, let's do brenda's first yeah um, oh yeah you can read it sorry yeah you can read the question yeah the question is uh can you walk through some examples of b2b enterprise SaaS and past defensibility yeah um so absolutely um so b2b or enterprise SaaS. i'd say data moat that we had earlier i think that's a big one um so for example, um, uh, you know, Waymo, which is, you know, like in the autonomous space, which I, you know, is not always SaaS, right? But um, any company there, they're building a proprietary, um, you know, data set that's really powerful. Um, one thing you often hear in, in AI is, would you rather have the best algorithm or would you rather have the best, um, you know, data set uh, running and the largest data set running? Um, you know, and by the way, with AI, maybe it's not even an algorithm, it's a model. Um, but, but either way, kind of that's the point of the story is uh, the company that has an order of magnitude more data actually wins, even if, if some of their initial kind of engineering model wasn't as good. And so that's a data mode that can be very powerful. And that, you know, that comes up in consumer, like with Google um, and the number of pages they, they'd index provide an advantage, but that comes up in enterprise SaaS um, all the time, for example. Um, and there are other, you know, I guess, I, you know, I would talk to your angel investors and seed investors. I would talk to people who understand your business for each business. Um, you know, it, it's something separate you have to uncover. But the short answer is um, if one for your own business is not obvious to you, some source of, of real defensibility uh, and outside of something like first mover or just brand, um, then you really want to take a hard look. Like, why don't I have a good answer to that question? What will be my durable advantage? Uh, and you certainly when you're pitching investors, you don't want them making up that answer for you. Uh, you want to have lots of good ideas there um, and, and, and see what clicks. Uh, cool. Mike, do you want to turn off your uh, presentation and we'll just... Uh, we'll yeah, just sure. Uh, stop sharing. There, there we go. go. Um, yeah, I think so data mode makes a lot of sense in B2B. And, and I guess I can ask a follow up, which is, you yeah. know, you also mentioned um, high switching costs is another that is... That's another, yeah. Fast. Salesforce, MuleSoft. That's yeah. a great one. High switching costs, right? So make your product essential to the workflow and the business process that someone's using where it gets so hard to rip out um, that that's a strategic advantage or you know the the i not to call them cheesy but the old ones like from they do what, what a lot of um founders who are outside of the the kind of modern tech ecosystem sometimes think like i'll talk to a lawyer who doesn't know as much about startups right um, and I, once upon a time, I did a joint MBA in law degree, so I can pick on lawyers because, because uh, in theory, I was one. So um, a lawyer might think, oh, intellectual property and IP, every once in a while I'll get a pitch about, hey, I've got these amazing patents. Um, so, so that'll really help be my strategic advantage. Yes, maybe most modern uh, startups don't look at, most, most investors these days, at least in this kind of Silicon Valley ecosystem, and, and by that I also mean New York and Seattle and Austin and LA, um, and internationally in the, the big tech hubs with the big venture firm, they're not looking at IP usually because it's so contentious, there's so much litigation, it's so unclear that as you get a, to be a bigger company, you probably need an IP strategy and a portfolio and you figure that stuff out. Um, but it, it's usually not the thing that helps startups. That said, if you have some kind of an incredible engineer that had a breakthrough that's difficult to replicate, more so than the patent around the software they developed, um, but just the fact that you employ that people or that team of people, um, you know, that could be uh, a strategic advantage as well. So these are all examples for, you know, that could apply to B2B. Okay, great. Why don't we go into the next uh, most voted question? You can see it from Dan yeah. Hepworth. It's, um, yeah. are, do marketplace need to be hacky often at the start? You mentioned yeah. B2B, they su siphoned supply from Craigslist and sent professional yeah. photographers, right? It was very famous. Are there other yeah. examples like that? Yeah, here's the reality as I'm a, you know, like four time founder, um, all startups need to be hacky from what I've seen at the start. You need, that was that effective and proprietary method of distribution. Um, you need to roll up your sleeves. And now if hacky means like, um, hacky shouldn't mean illegal or unethical. You've got to be ethical and legal, right? But you have to find novel ways of bootstrapping the way you start, you know, with Yelp to get started. Yelp's not a pure marketplace um, uh, un un until we close the transaction, but it often gets lumped in the marketplace category. Um, and Yelp licensed a bunch of yellow page data with local directory listings of like, 
name, phone number. And this is all, you know, above board licensing and that data, but that really helped bootstrap us. And it was funny because at the beginning, I used to go do those licensing contracts in New Market. Uh, I had to pay these yellow page companies around the world to be able to get their data, name, address, phone number, just to kind of bootstrap so we had all the listings to get started. But then eventually they started paying me to, to get an updated listing because we actually had the latest data on the, all these companies because we had a self-cleaning database at Yelp. So, um, you know, that's a strategic advantage example. Like we got started, they, we had to pay to get it at first, but we ended up having a more va valuable data set. Um, you've got to find a hack. You've got to do something unorthodox. If you're just kind of paying for users, you, you should, you can and should test paid user acquisition early on. But if your only source of user acquisition is paid user acquisition and you don't have something proprietary or interesting or hacky around both supply and demand, you, I think you have a problem on your hands in the early phases of any startup, consumer or, or enterprise. So it's really a hack that works for the early stages until the marketplace yep. starts to generate its own uh, traction. Sure. Is that cool. Um, then the next question uh, is from anonymous attendee. Um, the nature of pre-seed funding with an MVP app in a highly regulated industry. So there's a catch-22, okay. they say, of okay. a small round to start and finish. How do you evaluate those investments? How should you approach What it? is the nature of raising pre-seed round funding with an MVP app in a highly regulated, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so, so the question here is, how do you evaluate as pre-seed? Look, I think pre-seed is really tough. Pre-seed only recently got professionalized. I think the nature of the question here is like, hey, I might not even have uh, something defensible or, or durable or a strategic advantage when I'm at this pre-seed stage. I just need some basic starter money to build. And I would say this is almost tangential or, or orthogonal to the talk today, but it, it is related. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, it, a couple of thoughts here. One, keep in mind, Pre-Seed only recently professionalized. Um, so 10 years ago, like when I was co-founding Stitcher, I hadn't even heard of this term Pre-Seed. Even Seed was like angels. If you wanted money for an idea that was an idea on a napkin and you were a first time founder, you didn't already have a relationship with venture capitalists who thought you were great because you were a departing executive from one of their portfolio companies or something like that. Um, you just had to bootstrap and scrounge cash from relatives or max out credit cards and do all this crazy stuff. It's not like pre-seed is a God-given, you know, right that everyone just has to, to pre-seed funding. Um, and so if you're in this highly regulated industry and you need legal costs, the good news is um, pre starting a company is cheaper than it's ever been. So you don't actually need to get that much money from friends, family, former bosses, people who believe in you, whoever it is, if you're lucky enough to know a pre-seed investor like Charles Hudson at Precursor Ventures, um, Anamitra Banerjee at a four, or even Pear that will look very early, you know, the Pear Accelerator um, and, you know, Pear Seed will, will go, I think, you, you'll tell me, go fund two guys in a, in a napkin or whatever, two guys or gals. Um, but, but that is kind of tougher um, and you want to kind of progress as much as you can without it. Now, the good news in a highly regulated industry, your approach to getting in, I, you know, I know a company that said, hey, our regulation recently passed in California that we helped lobby for. And so part of our defensibility is we're the first to take advantage of this regulation and it's hard for others to enter. So that could be, you could have a regulatory advantage um, uh, as well. Yeah. And you're right. We do do a lot of this sort of pre-seed investment. In fact, a right. lot of favorite favorite investments are where we're you know trying to sign the deal, but there's no corporation to sign it with yet. And ah. then we sign it, and then we're ready to wire the money, and they don't have a bank account. And that's uh, us. Awesome. You know, it's it, it's definitely fun. I think uh, the I think you're right. Everything you said, I I agree with, and I think the only thing I can add is that um, you know a lot of times um, I feel like the the real question is whether you understand the customer demand. Like you yeah. probably don't need regulatory approval to be able to go talk to some customers and have them say, yes, I desperately need a solution to this problem and then have some hypothesis of how you would solve it and, you know, um, and, and make some progress on like, maybe there's even talk about they would do a pilot if you built it or something. That's great. Um, yeah. And then another, like one people more analogy. Happy. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. Um, so a couple of things, one, but to be clear, like for us, I focus more at series A um, and some series B, not as much in this stage. So I think talk to our friends, talk to Niels if you're doing pre-seed, 
And then if Niels backs you, that's the best way to get in front of a Series A investor. And then talk to me as you kind of get a little more momentum. We typically look for what we call product market fit. Um, I will give one more analogy though for the pre-seed that I give is kind of like starting a pre-seed company is kind of like starting a band. And every once in a while you'll meet someone who's like, hey, I want to start a band. And it's like, okay, well, uh, do you play an instrument? No. Uh, do you sing? Are you a great singer? No, I'm, I'm hoping to take some voice lessons. It's like, okay, well maybe like go get some voice lessons, go get an instrument, become an expert in something so that you could be a valuable band member and other great band members want to be your co-founder. And so with startups, that's, do you know how to code? Do you know, are you a great designer? Are you great at selling customers? Do you have experience at some great company? At least get some of those building blocks, like you're trying to form your band. And A, you'll get other better band members to come to you. And B, investors will be more interesting in underwriting that band, signing your band, um, because it looks more promising. The, you know, if it's, hey, I've just got this great idea, but I don't play any instruments, mm -hmm. then it, it, it's tougher. And, and to extend your analogy, analogy, like if you've actually booked a venue where they, they definitely want your kind of music, that helps. Totally, like, pre-sold, yeah. So. You're like, hey, we already have a bunch of acts and a bunch of shows booked, and <laughs> we're gonna be on the radio. We just need to help, you know, pay for some, you know, fine tune our equipment and stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, awesome. Um, Mike, uh, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, Erhan asked about data moats, and I think he clarified it in the comments a little bit um, yeah. that he was asking, you know, very early stage, um, high switching costs and lots of data is, you know, happens later in his yeah. assertion. So, you know, if the company is a pre-seed, how do you kind of talk about a data moat? Yeah, so that's a good question. And the, so many of these, by the way, network effects for the marketplace is also, you know, later. Mo a lot of these defensibility advantages happen later. And so what you have to do is just show that they will exist. Show that if you're the first to get to them, you can take advantage of them. And then, and this is why you raise venture capital, run like hell to grab them. VCs are used to this. That's the kind of businesses we want to invest in. A business that says, hey, we don't need, we're not in a race. We're just slow and steady, you know, wins the race. We're kind of the tortoise, not the hare. We'll slowly build our business at like 30% growth a year. And we'll quietly build a big company. And yeah, if somebody copies us, they could get ahead, but nobody's paying attention. That's actually not the typical venture back story. Like you might build a great profitable company that way. And maybe you should just never raise venture capital. That, you know, not, venture capital is not fit for every business. Um, and, you know, um, Craigslist, they're not a good example there because they did have suicide network effects, but they kind of like went down a little bit of that path and not really doing VC. Um, VCs want to hear that, hey, I don't have the data moat yet but I, I bootstrapped it. A lot of companies I've talked to, like, hey, I jump-started it. You know, I invested in this company, uh, MD Algorithms, MD Agni, that had a dermatology database that the founder was able to get to, from his father, who was the top dermatologist in Israel, right? Like, that was a, a data moat. We just invested in AirVet, speaking of, you know, your father doesn't always have to be helpful for the business or whatever, or your parent, but um, AirVet, the, the guy's the founder's dad is a, a celebrity veterinarian in LA, and like that helped with a bunch of deal flow. So it, you know, some, something can prime your data moat pump to get started, but you don't actually even need that. Just if you can prove that you're going to be the first to get there, and if you just raise this money, it's going to be hard for others to get there. If when an investor says, hey, if I give you $10 million, but somebody else can just come and, and give $10 million, and they'll be right there behind you in a matter of months, that's bad news. You have to show that once you get the data moat, it's locked in at scale, um, even if you or early on don't quite have it. So I hope that helps clarify. That's great, thank you. Um, should we keep going? Let's see. Yeah. Um, I'm just going by the ones that were, uh, that were upvoted here. Um, yeah. um, Binyamin asked, how does owning the payment flow add to strategic defensibility versus does it just add more friction? Yeah, well, um, I think, uh, you know, adding the payment flow definitely can add strategic, uh, you know, defensibility if uh, it, it makes sense. It's got to make sense for the user experience, but I'll give you, you know, like Yelp is a great example, right? Uh, if you had to go find food delivery in the Yelp app, but then you had to go download another app to actually get that food delivered, um, that's less sticky for Yelp. And it's actually a worse user experience. It, when we acquired E24 and now through the partnership with Grubhub and, and others, like when you're right there in the Yelp app, you find a great restaurant and you can just click order there. It's better for the user and um, it, it helps the strategic, strategic advantage of Yelp. So the payment flow often actually helps your defensibility and is good for the user. 
There might be examples, uh, you know, where it adds friction, but that's actually, in my experience, recently at least, over the past several years, when we've seen this come up, um, the payment flow has helped more than it's hurt when it, it made sense to add. Now, if your customers, if it doesn't make sense for them to pay for whatever reason in your app, you know, that's, there might be specific situations we could talk about. Great, okay. Um, I'm looking through some of the other questions here. Yeah. Um, um, I think we could just go to this next one. Let's see. Well, there was a question from Joe Webe about building a marketplace. If one side is easy to onboard, like students, how do you keep them engaged and add value while you build the second part of the platform? Yeah. Work. This is called the chicken and the egg problem, marketplace. Like you grow one size, and by the way, so there, it's chicken and the egg, and it's also like you build one side, but then there's not enough liquidity for the other side, and then you're trying to build the other side, and you're kind of like, so sometimes I ask founders like, which side is the more valuable side? And they go, well, I don't know, it's shifted. And that's true. Sometimes when you're Uber, you're trying to add drivers, but then you're like, wait, we don't have enough riders to meet the demand. Drivers are complaining, they're not getting enough rides. We need to scramble to add riders. And it kind of goes back and forth. And so you do have to watch both sides and build simultaneously. Um, but there are some mechanisms like you could have wait lists you can let in, you can do metering where you only let in so much supplier demand. If you think one side is, is constrained, you only let so much of the other side. You create incentives and you say, okay, here are the, you know, like power sellers, uh, you know, they're kind of above. So you find ways to get more visibility for either people who are early or who exhibit better behavior or create a better experience for your users. And then you create incentives for the newer or smaller entrants who are less valuable to you to enter that pack. So like with E24, we would try to tell restaurants, hey, you're not delivering fast enough. We notice we send you a delivery and you take over an hour to deliver. And you know that, that user usually churns off our service. They didn't have a good experience. So call us when you can get your delivery down to half an hour. Um, and meanwhile, we're, be, we're gonna be funneling orders to these top 10 restaurants in this you know, market that are doing really, really well. And so the, you, the message you send to the top 10 restaurants is like, hey, you know, we'll funnel lots of users to you. So these are, things you can do if, if you're not getting enough traffic on one side or the other. Great. Um, so um, Mike, we have a question from Jim Buguadia, who I've actually known for many years. So hi, Jim, yeah. good to see you. Um, he had a question about uh, on the enterprise side, any thoughts on defensibility for open source software and open core? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you know, at, at Canvas, we've actually spent a bunch of time on open source software models. We have one open source investment actually recently that hasn't been announced. Um, I think there's a lot of um, defensibility there um, because um, if, you, uh, if you put out um, something that's, that's open source um, and there's kind of a, uh, an open source movement around. So often what you'll see is uh, the company commercializing uh, some area of open source software, the founders of that company or that company is also actually maintaining, um, you know, that open source standard. So like Sourcegraph is one company I'm familiar with that does this. Um, that can be a huge uh, area of defensibility. Why? Because you employ the foremost experts on that open source standard. And while there's this huge network of developers who are kind of building for it, you've got the, the, you know, the goose that lays the golden eggs. You're moderating the community. You probably own some of the forums. Um, and you've got all the data you're watching on usage on the platform. And you're seeing like, hey, somebody hit some kind of gate and, and somebody's like, you know, open source kind of, um, you know, their, their usage is spiking and you say, well, here are all these advanced features, you know, don't you want these? Um, well, you need to get onto the enterprise version of this product. Um, so it can be, you know, there, there's a blurry line there, you know, a lot of that logic applies to kind of freemium models as well. Um, but anything that applies to freemium on defensibility can also apply to open source. And I think that can be a, a great way to, to do it. Great. Thank you. Um, and then Brenda Jin, uh, who's in our accelerator, uh, asked about um, how do you balance hard to rip out with market resegmentation? So she has a more detailed example there. I don't know if you're reading that. But yeah. Yeah. For example, part of the way it might be uh, to identify a core, part of the way it might be to identify a core flow that is unsatisfied, but maybe it's easy for um, an incumbent to add to their suite. How do you build that out over time once you have your first one? Um, yeah, so 
Do you need a clarification on it or do you, do you fully understand? I think question? I kind of, you know what, I'll speak to it and then Brenda can, can tell us if there's clarification. And Brenda, feel free to type any more if you have more clarification that you could help. So I think the idea is like you, you put in, you insert yourself into one part of the workflow that makes your software, and this is a problem more B2B, very um, essential and hard to rip out. But now you're trying to, you know, add either serve different verticals or you're changing the software or serve different workflows. And so, you know, you've, you've kind of invested in the one, but now you're trying to do others. Um, and how do you spread? And I think, you know, that's an important, I, I think that's an important focus question. Because I do see on the, on the enterprise software side, companies that try to do too much too soon, either serve too many verticals or too many use cases. And they kind of don't, they're not essential in any of them. They just have like 15 nice to have features or they serve 10 verticals so-so. Instead of, uh, what, as an investor, what I like to see, and for your own sake, I'd much rather say, see that you have like one core workflow that you nail where you're indispensable. You're building maybe a second or third one and, and those show early promise, but really one thing, use case you nail. And you're doing that for two to three verticals with killer white paper case studies from those customers who say like, oh my God, I can't live without this software. It's essential. And I can't find a competitor to do it. Um, and maybe it's because they have a data mode or something proprietary that's allowing them to be this, this essential. Um, that's your defensibility rather than boiling the ocean and serving too many verticals or, or too many use cases. So I don't know if that kind of got to Brenda's question, but, but hopefully that helps answer. Um, hopefully she'll tell us if she's, uh, if, if it doesn't, she's not shy. So that's a good thing. There we go. <laughs> um, thanks Brenda. Um, and then, uh, if we just go to the next questions, there's several here with one vote. Um, sure. there's one about in disintermediation. Do you want to try that one? Yeah. From Aditya? yeah. And so Aditya is asking, how would you measure the degree of disintermediation of business faces? Um, particularly when the need for intermediation relies on the lack of convenience between the parties to get introduced and transact. For example, where Airbnb users could, as Aditya has tried, to contact the host directly and make a booking. So TaskRabbit is the best example. TaskRabbit is like the textbook disintermediation. TaskRabbit could have, in theory, been this multi-billion dollar company. Um, but that didn't really happen. And, and why didn't it happen? It was, you know, a smaller acquisition for IKEA. Um, but why did that uh, not happen? Well, um, their, their use case uh, and, and their... their so, so a couple of things. One, uh, remember we talked about frequency of use. TaskRabbit for many people was kind of infrequent. It's like, oh, I need a handyman. Oh, I need this person. And then when they would get this person one off, there maybe would be a frequent usage with that, with that let's say a handyman comes. Um, and this happened to me, I had a handyman come out. And it was kind of like, why do I need the TaskRabbit app exactly? And you, know, you should ask yourself, and the investors ask this, if you haven't built valuable enough software to make you need TaskRabbit again the second time, or put another way, if people can disintermediate, they will. And if it's easier to just call that handyman, once they come to your house, they leave you a business card, you're gonna call them if TaskRabbit payment isn't so wonderful or extra convenient. Airbnb, on the other hand, it's actually pretty valuable. Like I don't necessarily trust a stranger's, you know, to, to give them my credit card for thousands of dollars. I kind of like the Airbnb guarantee that they're gonna back it up a little bit, that there's some customer service there that that person has to honor my reservation. Otherwise their reputation will get dinged. You know, they're, they're gonna care about my rating and review. So whether, whether you've tried to disintermediate Airbnb or not, they insert enough value in that equation that as you can see, it's retained value. Or let's take Uber, right? With Uber, it's, it's an interesting example that like, I don't want the same driver every time. I want the closest driver. It doesn't have to be the best driver, right? Uh, and, and most people don't predict uh, what time of day and where they're going to go accurately enough to need a regular driver. They just need to want to be able to press a button on demand and get a driver. So Uber fa faces very little disintermediation. And that's why I said you kind of have to, to ask it. Uber, Uber wasn't making things less convenient for people by being hard to disintermediate. It's the very fact that they're so convenient that makes it hard to disintermediate. Um, if you find that for your business, the only way to reduce the risk of disintermediation is purely by adding arbitrary friction for your users, that's a red flag. Look at the Uber example, look at the Airbnb example, and look at the TaskRabbit example and ask yourself, why am I more like TaskRabbit than Uber? What's wrong here? Is there more value I could provide, more convenience I could provide that actually make me harder to disintermediate? 
Um, Mike, are you still good for another 10 minutes or so? Yes. Because we definitely have some great questions. Let's go. Let's, let's Maybe I'll, I'll ask you just one that's um, just a yeah. logistical question. Farshad asked, what's the best way to reach you? Is there a way to reach you that- Ask makes new Mike on Twitter. Just go to Twitter here. Let me, um, let's just put that like in the, in the chat maybe. I'll just put it into the Q&A also. So that's good. Yeah, okay, put it great. in the chat. I should have like put it on the screen, but at new Mike. Cool. Just not the old Mike, but the new Mike. Not the, new Mike. Not the same old Mike. This is not your father's Mike. Yeah, it's the new okay. Mike. And I actually wanted to ask you one question. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I can't even write a question in here. Otherwise I wouldn't like bypass the process, but um, I was wondering. Um, I upload you, so there you go. There you go. <laughs> High switching costs um, as defensibility. The one thing that I wonder about that is, does that also kind of mean that you become in a situation where you are as a small startup in a land grab almost? Like, yes, once you get a customer, they can't switch off you. But you know, if someone else funds a company six months later or a year later, are they just kind of in a battle for, for market share and whoever's fastest wins? Absolutely. It's not just the high switching costs, which, which by the way, that could be for, you know, enterprise and SaaS, but the entire marketplace, you know, check for all the marketplaces. This is what makes, you know, hopefully for the founders out there, a light bulb should be going off. Like, oh, this is why these VCs chase these unprofitable companies and throw lots of money at them and try to fund them faster. This is why... Some companies try to like, you know, put off delaying their, their announcement of what they're even doing till later is that, that's the game is everyone's trying to raise a bunch of money, grab, do this land grab, get a bunch of sticky customers with high switching costs before someone else realizes that that hole was even there. Um, because once everyone else realizes and gets funded, it might be too late. Mm -hmm. Which really is like a first mover advantage in that case. It's a first mover advantage, um, uh, but it's not a first mover advantage alone. So the, the trap is you'll see these pitches for a business with no high switching costs and no defensibility. And they go, we're the first mover. So that's great. And it's like, that's only great if you had the defensibility to back it up. Yeah. Um, I want to go a little bit further down the list. There's a question from Aditi I thought was really interesting, which is why isn't brand defensible? Couldn't anyone yeah. with major dollars build the same tech if a small startup can? And I think he's sort of implying that um, maybe brand can help you. Yeah, I think brand is a source of defensibility. It is a difficult source of defensibility for a startup to pitch. So I don't always like include it in the menu. I think, you know, trying to with a straight face come in and say, well, we're going to build the biggest brand for X. Um, but, but it can be a source of defensibility. If you can somehow borrow or use a, a big brand that already exists and that's gonna jumpstart your business, that could be a source of defensibility. But I, I think that's totally fair and brand can be. Okay. Um, if we go back up to the top now, um, a couple bubbled up to two upvotes, which we'll take as an endorsement. So Brian Kim asked if we've seen trends where uh, in the near future corporate social responsibility. So CSR is a mean of strategic defensibility, not just for big companies, but for startups. Yeah, and I think somebody else I saw somewhere just said, um, in a post COVID world, you know, should we be talking about um, social uh, responsibility, um, uh, you know, for startups as well? Yeah, we can probably just answer both of those in one swoop. Yeah, right? so, so look, I think this is a great question. And I think totally, look, uh, this can definitely be um, your source of defensibility. Um, there's a whole new way. There were kind of the clean tech, look for Tesla, part of what sold Tesla cars was this is better for the environment. People feel good. That was a, a simultaneously a branding thing, a better mousetrap, a better user experience. But fundamentally, even with the savings on gas, Teslas were generally more expensive than the next best car alternative. All, you know, for the first 10 years of the life of the company. Um, but they were plugging into a psychographic source of defensibility, you know, with, with customers and investors alike who, you know, wanted that and funded that. Um, and, you know, so that's on the kind of social res responsibility around the climate angle. There's plenty of other um, categories where you can show social responsibility, um, you know, around clean products, around, society. you know, Blue Nile uh, early on to give kind of a web 1.0-ish type example. Blue Nile said, hey, we have 100% conflict-free diamonds. You know, why you watch that movie, uh, Blood Diamond, do you really want to go in a kind of back alley in, uh, you know, Union Square, or San Francisco or New York and, and buy from a diamond dealer who you don't trust? Or do you want Blue Nile to certify that this is conflict-free? 
you know, that's, a, I think there are, I, I think people should be uh, definitely thinking about, um, you know, social responsibility uh, as part of it. Um, and there's obviously, you know, diamonds are, are a luxury item and, and at, near the bottom of the list uh, when you're normally thinking about social responsibility, but I'm thinking of an older example to show that, um, that this has been around. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that. I think generation, generationally, if you look at kind of demographic survey data, um, the new generation that's emerging cares about social responsibility, you know, and, and, and climate, social justice, racial equality, um, all of these issues, much more um, than previous generations. And I'm, I'm very happy as an investor to see that. It's part of the reason I joined Canvas, it's part of the reason I joined Social Capital, is we really care about that mission and investing in companies that we think have a positive social impact, even if we're not a double bottom line um, explicitly fund. Um, so I think those can all be sources of strategic advantage and you wanna think about them. You just have to look yourself in the mirror and say, can somebody else use the exact same pitch and copy me? Um, you do have to worry about that because then you're no longer defensible. You're just saying social responsibility, but it's, it's very copyable. Yeah. Um, can we do a couple more? I know I can go over. I don't have a hard stop after this. So all right. Um, people have more questions. As long as let's roll. Let's roll. Will you stop me before the recording of this gets too long? I know <laughs> for people watching later, but yeah. William Steinbeffen is actually uh, in our accelerator also. And awesome. yeah, so yeah, it's great. They're, they're coming here. He asked as a SaaS company uh, in an industry where market players don't like to share data. So he, they're working insurance. Yeah. Um, he views the interaction of user data to be strong defensibility, the interaction and user data. Yeah. Do you have any cases where you've seen this defense? Totally. Uh, you know, Google had, where are people clicking? Uh, when you know they see the search results, right? That's a source of data. Um, what do what do people prefer? Where do they go? I'm trying to, I, you know, I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, I'd say the fact that I don't have like ten, you know, right off the top of my head examples there uh, means that it's probably a weaker and not um, on the kind of top three list of like bulletproof sources of defensibility that mm -hmm. at least investors are used to seeing. Um, so you just want to kind of dig in if that's going to be your source of defensibility, which might be okay. I would like, here's a great assignment for everybody. If you, you know, be able to write a, a full page on your defensibility. If it's not a marketplace and you're not going to, you know, answer my 15 marketplace checklist questions, or if you're not a marketplace, make up your own 10 or 15 questions and answer them, you know, with a friend and your co-founder or your early investors, you should feel really good about it. If you can do that for interaction and user data, then fantastic, you, you, you have it fleshed out. If it feels like you're, you're, you're BSing yourself or you're spinning it a little bit or stretching it, um, then your defensibility might not be as strong. That's great, and um, William actually asked in chat uh, a follow-up question about what about Salesforce, for example? What was their defensibility? Um, he doesn't, yeah, he says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Salesforce's defensibility, I had them in that like high switching cost. Yeah. As, a, as a Salesforce user at Yelp, we had like thousands of seats on Salesforce, one of the most seats, right? Selling in SMBs with a multi-thousand um, person Salesforce. It mm -hmm. was extremely hard for us to rip and replace Salesforce. Salesforce gets so embedded and hooked in. Um, and by the way, on top of that, another smart thing is make yourself a platform if you're enterprise software. So Salesforce invested early in and had the Salesforce developers in the conference and Mark Benioff is a quasi religious leader every year. People pay this pilgrimage to the Mecca of Mark and you know, they're all kind of watching him on stage and they want to get on stage and then they're building it to his APIs. And then you have Salesforce black belt level one, two, three developers. You have a whole ecosystem and you're like, even if I re replace this thing, what would I replace it with and who could develop it and build that for me and who would build third party software on it? I mean, that thing is so defensible. It's insane. He's done an amazing job of building that. And, and that didn't all happen day one, but piece by piece, they built that in. Awesome. Um, Mike, I think we could probably go all night because this is like, you know, such a, such an interesting set of topics, but yeah. I think what we, maybe we should do is uh, cut it here and, right. um, you know, unless there was any last thought you wanted to share with, with the group here based on the questions you got or anything else. No, look, I think this is great. Um, these were all uh, really thoughtful questions. Thank you so much for everybody. And thank you, Niels, for um, uh, you know, leading the conversation as well. Uh, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, you know, like I said, feel free to engage more on Twitter. Look forward to everything you're going to build and all the great uh, defensible businesses with the durable advantage that will come from this talk. 
I'm excited about that and good luck out there. Great. And Mike, we already got one review. This was one of the best speaker sessions in the series. So thank you very <laughs> much all right. thank you. for that. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Great to catch up. And thanks for uh, sharing all your wisdom with us. Thanks, guys. See you okay. later. Bye.